My dear brothers and sisters, this morning in the scriptures we hear these words about the compassion of God. This is what we hear in the first reading, as God is gathering his people back. He is bringing them back. He's giving them a word, actually, to let them know that the exile they have just experienced in their history is not going to be the end of the story. Jeremiah, as you know, is right in the midst of that time that the Jews are deported and they're taken away to Babylon. They're no longer in Jerusalem. A very small remnant is left. And God promises them that he's going to bring them back. Because even though he chastised them for their sins, he still had mercy and compassion on them. He didn't reject them. He instead promises them a restoration. And he talks to them about how the blind and the lame are going to be in their midst. We hear too in that second reading, the book of Hebrews, the letter of the Hebrews, excuse me, that our High priest Jesus knows our weaknesses. He knows them. And we see in the gospel as well. The Lord choosing to hear the cry of somebody that everybody else basically wanted to, to tell to shut up. There's a guy on the side of the road, Bartimaeus. And since... This was written originally in Greek. They make sure that they understand that the name Bartimaeus is his last name. That he's the son of Timaeus. It's like Johnson, you know. The son of John. right? That he's sitting in this roadside. And he calls out. Jesus, son of David, have pity on me. The question that comes to us is this. How do we expect the Lord to... To treat us. What is our way. Of interacting with God. When we recognize. If we recognize our sins. Do we think the Lord is going to bring about. All sorts of chastisement. Or do we see the Lord as. One who is the healer as well. One who wants to bring about a restoration. Not just. To tell us what our sins are. And and tell us. What we have to experience because of them. Many times we can take the perpetual victim mentality. Which is that we think that because of our sins. That we're just supposed to bear and suffer their consequences. And if we think that we wouldn't be alone. Because it's one of the things that we as a Christian people have to struggle with. As we learn more and more about who God is. Now I don't mean that we're learning more in terms of what our faith tells us. But sometimes what happens is this. We might understand something as a people. Right? But our hearts are slow to catch up. Our hearts are maybe still acting as if God were waiting for us to get our act together before forgiving us. Sometimes we act more out of the way sinful humanity treats us than we do in terms of how God treats us. Because we're not used to being treated this way. One thing that can show us that God's mercy and compassion is greater than what we can imagine is this. He took every single one of our sins of all of humanity from the past up to his time, Jesus that is. And all the sins from the time of Jesus to the end of the world, he took them all on the cross and died for them all. He took all of their consequences. His will is to defeat the works of Satan. That's his will. We know this to be true. He came and he says, he, we, we hear that. The Son of Man came to defeat the works of the devil. That's what scripture tells us. So, When we look at things like the disease, the poverty, the illness, the oppression from evil, right? Is that from God? Yes or no? No, it's not. It's a result of sin, right? Who caused sin? The devil, originally, right? Well, we were complicit. We did it too, right? We have to admit that. Right? Okay. But we see time and time again 
that the ones who get punished in the Old Testament are the ones who, when God shows them their sin and brings their sin to light, try to hide it and be like, no, no, no. Now, I was right. Right? And the ones who God favors aren't necessarily the, the perfect. He favors the ones who are able to say, yes, Lord, it was me. Have mercy. Like David. An adulterer and a murderer. Right? If we know our scriptures, we know that David was an adulterer and a murderer. And yet, when his sin was brought to light, he didn't say, no, no, that wasn't me. I'm innocent. I'm framed. He said, have mercy on me. In fact, he wrote an entire psalm about it. Have mercy on me, God, in your kindness. In your compassion, blot out my offense. Oh, wash me thoroughly from my sin and from my guilt. Cleanse me. God's mercy, God's compassion challenges us because then it asks us to reconsider two points. I'm going to make it easy today. Okay? The first is, what do we expect of Jesus? The second is, how are we showing that compassion? That same compassion. What do we expect of Jesus? Bartimaeus gets up. He, he doesn't let people silence him. He continues to call out to the Lord. Notice he doesn't argue with the people, right? He just continues to call out to Jesus. Because he's seen what Jesus does. Or at least he's heard what Jesus does. He has heard that Jesus can heal people, wills to heal people. He's probably heard the story of the woman who was able to get to Jesus and touch the hem of his garment and be healed. But here he is, he's a blind man and there's a big crowd and he knows he can't get to Jesus because he doesn't know which one's Jesus. Right? He just hears Jesus is passing by. So he calls out, Jesus, son of David, have pity on me. Jesus says to the people, call him. It's funny how like, you can go from being someone who's told to shut up to being everybody's favorite. right? When the guy who, who they're all crowding around all of a sudden points out, hey, I want, I want that person, right? I want that person. Because then they're like, oh yeah, come on, hey, <laughs> have courage. <laughs> it's like all of a sudden, everybody becomes his best friend. Because <laughs> he's getting noticed by Jesus. Bartimaeus does something interesting that we might miss in the gospel. He throws off the cloak. It's a change of clothing, a change of identity. He's saying, I'm leaving the blind beggar identity behind. And he goes up to Jesus, and Jesus says, what do you want? What do you want me to do for you? Now, Bartimaeus has plenty of options. He could say, God, just give me the grace to bear my blindness. But he doesn't. He says, Master, I want to see. If we're honest, we know that sometimes we ask Jesus for the grace just to get by. But Jesus tells us in John's Gospel, we hear it again and again, about not only how he is able to heal people, even people who were, were, maybe were afflicted with a particular disease because of their sins, and then even people who were afflicted just because, not because of their sins, but just because there's sin in the world. There's just evil in the world, right? Right? Not because that person in particular sinned, but just because of the circumstances. We see that time and time again. We hear in John's Gospel that Jesus came to give us life and life in abundance. And that it's the devil's job to steal, kill, and destroy, not Jesus's. So one of the things that we want to make sure that we throw off today, you know, if we can imagine ourselves... As Bartimaeus today. We want to throw off the cloaks that have been cloaking us. The things that make us think that we have to somehow earn God's grace. That he's not just going to freely give it to you. That somehow. That somehow. 
we have to be good enough. That somehow we have to be smart enough. Or that somehow we have to know certain things. No, we don't. We might have to persevere, which is what Jesus said, right? We might have to keep asking. It might not happen all at once. We see Bartimaeus doing this, persevering, not giving up. Not taking the lack of, result, of an immediate result as a sign that God didn't care. He does care. Sometimes he makes us wait. So that sometimes the breakthrough is even better. But we want to throw off those mentalities that, that have us saying, God, just get me by. God, it doesn't say that Jesus came that we might survive and have survival mode in abundance. No, he said, Jesus came that we might have life and life in abundance. Now, don't get me wrong. The life that God gives us is not you know, what we might think of, like a party scene or... or Possessions that you know are frivolous. If God wanted to bless us with particular riches and possessions for our good and the good of others, trusting us not to let that corrupt us, that'd be a different story. But we want to get rid of the survival mode. And the reason why is because it's the survival mode that has been keeping the church back now. For over 150 years at least. The church has heard, either through the Holy Fathers or through prophetic utterances that is apparitions of the Blessed Virgin Mary, that God wants to do something for the church in particular. To have the church experience an explosion of grace, a new Pentecost. The problem is, it's been taking forever. Why? Because we haven't thrown off the beggar identity. We haven't thrown off the blind beggar mentality. To say that maybe God can help us to see what he wants us to see, to be able to continue to search out the kingdom of God so that we can see literally the lame healed and the blind able to see. Because that's one of the promises that God has given to us. That calls us to our second point. When we experience this compassion that Jesus has for us, it changes us. Because it gets us concerned about other people. Concerned about those who don't see. Not to try to convince them with like all the force of argument. But to convince them out of love and out of concern that there is a God who cares. Who addresses their needs. So that instead of just arguing about, whoa, who's... Who's causing this group of migrants to come through Mexico? And, and then arguing about, you know, whether it's right to accept them or not. We, we know our faith. We know what our faith says. Our faith keeps two things in tension, doesn't it? It says there's a right of rule of law, right? It'd be silly to throw open your borders, right? Yes or no? That'd be wrong, Right? You know, you don't open up the door to your house and say, let anybody come in who you don't know. But at the same time, we also have that concern and compassion for the poor. But people will take the sides and they'll forget that there's a tension there. Right? Not simply to just side with one thing and then throw the other one off. But it should literally cause us to realize that we don't have all the answers. And still care about the situation in a particular way where we cry out to the Lord, Jesus, Son of God, have pity on us in this situation and on our brothers and sisters. Help us to figure out what is the right way to handle this. Help us to figure out how we can help the people to want to stay in their own countries. How we can stop having policies and politics that continue to support the corrupt politicians in their own countries to allow the rich to continue to get richer, those who oppress other people unjustly to continue to oppress them. And don't get me wrong, but neither party actually is pro-immigrant. I've seen that in my, in my work as 
a justice and peace animator and as a Franciscan, I've seen neither political party is actually pro-immigrant. Neither of them. There's a talk, but there isn't action. Other people who were much more radical in, in terms of, quote-unquote, the political spectrum of being liberal than I was, even complained about the Obama administration and the way that the Obama administration was paying Mexico to do the border patrolling. So we want to make sure that we're not blind. The answer is our politicians do not care. Neither side. So if we think we're right, quote unquote, on one side or the other, we're actually wrong. That's why the church is called to have compassion on those who are less fortunate. Compassion that can actually bring about not just some kind of a political solution, but literally liberate lives. Dream with me a bit. Imagine with me a bit. Remember the words of Jesus when he said that the one who believes in me, the works I have done, he or she will do and and greater. That means raising the dead, healing the blind, the sick, the lame. Casting out demons. Liberating people. Helping to liberate people from oppression. In 2015, a woman that I know in New Hampshire took a team of people down to Honduras to minister to some local lay Catholic leaders to help them be freed from the oppression they've experienced through the violence and just the, the spiritual issues that people face. You know, sometimes not knowing better going to occult practices because it's just in the culture, right? You know, even though people think, oh yeah, even quote-unquote Christian or Catholic people are recommending these occult practices with their occult practices. And the people unsuspectingly walk under the dominion of evil. She was ministering to this one leader, her team I should say, was ministering to this one leader who had been abducted and had prayed for God to liberate her And asked Jesus, Jesus, free me, and she didn't get a response. And so she thought that Jesus didn't care. And the last moment, she goes, her her captor allows her to go into the bathroom, allows her, you know, some time there and says, if you're not out in two minutes, I'm coming in there. So she decides that she's just going to stay in there and she's got a piece of mirror ready for when he comes in because she's done. She wants to end it. But instead she prays to Our Lady Guadalupe and says, Our Lady, if you are real, deliver me from this situation. Two minutes pass and there's no knock on the door. She's wondering what's going on. Five minutes pass, no knock on the door. So she shyly opens the door, sees that the guy is asleep with the gun on, her, on his chest, just asleep on the floor. So she, what does she do? She grabs the gun, right? And after a moment of temptation, let's be honest, I I might be tempted to do that too if I'd been abducted and God knows what happened to me. After the moment of temptation, she decides instead to just run out the door and she throws the gun in the street as she runs. As the team was ministering to her, It was able to help her to realize that Jesus hadn't abandoned her because Mary can never do anything apart from Jesus. And the change in her eyes, she went from this dull, lifeless blankness in her eyes to vibrant, beautiful, dark brown. After they got done praying with her, helping her to take authority to know, to call upon the Lord Jesus to know who she is as a daughter of God the Father. She says, I feel something. It's just this feeling I I can't explain. One of the team members thought that perhaps it was joy. So he suggested, hey, is it joy? And she says, yes, that's it. I've never felt it before. Brothers and sisters, Jesus is calling us to be his ministers of compassion. But first we got to know what it's like. 
You can't give away what you don't receive. So today we ask the Lord, Lord, if there is any blindness in us, we ask you to call it to our attention so that we can, we can trust that if you're calling it to our attention, you want to heal it. Jesus, we ask that if there's any areas of our lives where, where we have not been ministered to you, to, that when we come and not just see you in the Eucharist, but when you actually touch us and enter into us in the Eucharist, you might heal those areas. We also ask Jesus that if there's anybody that we know who is also struggling, that, that through our reception of the communion today, that you might heal them too. Because you've got grace enough for all of us. And Jesus, we ask you to stir up in our hearts, our imaginations, to dream with you. To be able to reach out to those who are in need. To bring true, truly just and compassionate solutions to the problems of today's world. And solutions that might even include some of us operating in the gifts of healing that you want the church to operate in. We ask that especially for those who may be called to minister to those who have been abused sexually. That inner healing might take place so that the church can no longer be held back by its sins. Jesus, we ask you all this knowing that you are compassionate to us. You do not treat us according to what we deserve, but you give us mercy and compassion and abundance. We thank you and we bless you. Amen.